you were asking me which books are most influential for me, the first one's going to be obvious. It's the Bible. Now, if you're a student of theology or biblical studies, you will read a lot of secondary literature, thoughts about the Bible, historical work into the Bible. That's all part of the mix. I want to say this. I became a Christian when I was 18. I hardly knew the Bible at all. I didn't grow up in the church, never read a Bible, and that was my first exposure to the Bible. But for the next 10 years of my life, I was in the Bible as much as I could be. And when I met my wife in my late 20s, she'd been a Christian her whole life, and she was amazed that, although I'd been a Christian for a much shorter time, that I knew the Bible much better than her, even though she was a Bible reader. I don't say that in a braggy way, but I'm just saying, if you have a strong foundation in the Bible, there's no better preparation for doing theology. If there's one book you just need to know backwards and forwards, it's the Bible. So make sure that Bible reading is just part of your habit. Uh, not reading it academically, reading it on your knees, reading it devotionally, and God will keep it in your memory. As far as books outside the Bible, one of my favorite books is called Mimesis. It's by a scholar by the name of Eric Oyerbach. And it, what it, uh, Mimesis is about, it's about representations of reality in Western literature. What Oyerbach does in each chapter is he walks through the history of the West and talks about how literature evolves, especially how literature depicts reality. And you say, well, like, why is that your favorite book? Here's why. It's because when I read Oyerbach when I was in college, I realized that here was a guy who could work through texts of many different languages uh, with such great sensitivity to what was going on. It was a model for me, not just to how to think about texts, uh, but just to how, how to approach life by, by looking, uh, approaching life very carefully, thoughtfully, reflectively, and looking for the nuances. And I can never encourage anyone enough to say, you know, don't read things too quickly. Read things, there's certain books that just demand to be read slowly, thoughtfully, let it soak in, let it become part of who you are, and let it train your eyes to how to look at reality differently. When I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is I read the Bible. I have a lectionary reading. It just tells me what to read. That way I don't have to have anxiety about what should I read today. So I'll, I'll focus on the Psalms and have an Old Testament reading, a New Testament reading, and of course a Gospel reading. And that takes about half an hour of my time because when it comes to the Psalm passage, I'll spend about 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes, just camping out there, slowly meditating. So that way, the scripture is the basis of my day. Sometimes I'll come back to it at noon or in the evening. Um, but that's the way I get started. Uh, later on in the morning, I'll read the paper. Um, and you know what I, I, I try to do is read different types of papers. Uh, say, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, just for different points of view. I want to see how different voices are interpreting reality as it's unfolding from day to day. During the course of the day, if the day goes well, I'll get some time in a kind of favorite book. Uh, normally a, a kind of scholarly book. Uh, later on in the evening, maybe before bed, I have a nightstand book. Um, history, uh, economics, whatever you have. Something that's just off topic that I hope will help keep me abreast of what's going on in different fields and something where I don't have to do the work right before I go to bed. So I suppose that's the best way to describe my reading day. When it comes to deciding what I read next, I'm, I'm pretty spontaneous and I, I'm pretty serendipitous. So if I see a book at Barnes & Noble or something, I'll say, I'll pick it up and I, I just might even buy it. Um, other times people say, have you read this? And I say no and I'll check it out. And within about 60 seconds, I'll make a decision as to whether to take it from the library or buy it. Um, I, when it comes to scholarship, what I want to do is I have questions. Uh, and I normally have about five or six projects going on at one time. And with each project, there's a series of questions or research areas where there's a working bibliography in my head. I, I try to get a master list of everything that's been written about that topic, if it's not too big. And I want to make sure, I, I mean, I have stacks of books around my office according to the project. And I, I just, I'm a little ADD, so I move around from project to project to project because I'll get bored if I'm sitting with one project too long and I'll go back over here. Um, you know, maybe that's not what they call deep work, but that's just the way I work best.
You know, when it comes to reading, I think you have to make an initial decision as to how quickly you want to read. Uh, depending on what your project is, some books, you just need to skim them very quickly. Read the intro, read the conclusion, get a good grip on the structure and the table of contents, and then rifle through really quickly. When you've been at, been at this game long enough, you, you see where arguments are going, and you don't necessarily need to read every last word. Uh, other books, uh, you might read more slowly, more thoughtfully. When I'm reading books outside of my discipline, I have to do that. I have to slow down because there's a learning curve. But when it comes to remembering, uh, very rarely will I take notes. I'll, sometimes I'll take notes in the margins. Sometimes I'll have a pencil when I'm uh, in a book with a ruler because I can't draw a straight line. And I'll just kind of, you know, I like this sentence and I'll put an exclamation point or I'll put a question mark. I go, I'm not sure about that. But that's my way of engaging with the text. Uh, I have an ability to um, remember exactly where on the written page something is. So I never use ebooks uh, because th that just gets lost to me. I need a hard copy. I know studies say that you retain things better in hard copy than electronically. So I just stick with that and uh, work through that. And it seems to stick most of the time. Uh, what I also sometimes do is you put little sticky tabs into really important passages. And if, it, if I wait too long on a project, sure, the memory bank might fade, but if uh, I can get the project done quickly enough, I'll be able to find where I, what I need when I need it. So when I've worked on a project, and let's just say it's done, I'll have a bunch of articles stapled together that I pulled off uh, some library resource like Atla, and I'll often have them in a three-ring binder with holes punched alphabetically by author and by date. And that's just like everything I need to know about the Lord's Supper in like these three binders right here. Um, of course, there's other books too, and I'm just mindful of the books. Sometimes what I'll do if I say, hey, I'm not going to be touching this for a while, is I'll get rid of the binders and just make sure everything's on PDF and a file folder on my computer. So if I need to pull it back up, I know where it is. Uh, but I can only do so many projects at once where I have full file folders. Sometimes there are books that are difficult to read, and there, there's two types of difficult, difficulties. One is sometimes a book is just poorly written, or maybe it's a, it's a translation in the original language. It was written well, but the translation comes out clunky, and you're like, huh? And you're trying to follow it along. I just read a book like that this past week. Uh, when I'm reading a book like that, that's just a clunky translation, I, you have to slow down and you say, okay, now what is exactly going on here? So well-written books, I feel like I can read more quickly, uh, in, at least in secondary literature of New Testament scholarship. Uh, but it's also a reminder to me, when it comes to writing, don't skip on, on the quality of the writing. If you're a good writer, it will be a, a favor to your readers uh, and you will help them remember what you do and your arguments will be more persuasive. Anyway, when it comes to working through that, yeah, I slow down for clunky writers. As far as cl classics, you know, if I'm reading through James Joyce's Ulysses, which I still don't get, but I still try to forge my way through, I do slow down and I try to absorb and go through reading as an aesthetic experience and pick up on the nuances, see how the language is working. Uh, it's, it's easy to read too fast uh, in our very hurried age. And I just feel that if, if you can get yourself in a leisurely mode, uh, then that's a good thing and you often go deeper. So if, if you wanna know how to make the shift to leisurely deep reading, I, I don't know if there's any easy cure except to say, you can't just read that kind of stuff five minutes at a time. You, you know, th that just won't work. What you need is big chunks of time where you say, yeah, I'm just gonna get a nice big cup of coffee. I'm gonna relax, I'm gonna settle down. This is gonna take a while. And I think the other key is make sure you have those chunks in a sustained way so it's not like, well, the last time I did this was a month ago, so I don't even know what this book is about anymore. So keep the discipline of, of having that time, of making that time into your schedule, where you basically go deep. One book I read in seminary that was influential for me and was forming for me was The Hardest Voss, Biblical Theology. It, it's a hard book to get through because it's a translation from the Dutch and it's one of those books where it's not extremely well written, but the ideas of, in it 
are very important in the way I, I've thought about the Bible and the way I've thought about Scripture. People don't read Voss so much these days because he seems so dated, but I feel like Voss is in a way one of those great neglected classics that he really gets it and really gets so much of where it's going. So if, if there's a classic I'd like to see retrieved, it's Voss. One book that I, I've enjoyed that some people might throw their eyebrows at this is Rudolf Bultmann's New Testament Theology. And the reason I like New, Bultmann's New Testament Theology isn't because I agree with his conclusions or even his methodology, but what I like about Bultmann is his ability to think in big pictures and ask big picture questions. And what's a shame with theology is that so often we get caught up in the minutia, and that's not bad, but sometimes it's just all minutia. And we have all too few people willing to step back and say, okay, what's going on here in the big picture? So Boltman has been criticized a lot over the decades, rightly so. I'm critical of him. But I appreciate the, the occasional voice who steps out and says, okay, here's my program, and I'm going to try to support it in a very broad, sweeping way uh, without worrying about, well, have you, ever pr have you proved every last jot and tittle of this whole argument? We can't have that. We either have to uh, have no big picture arguments at all or be, allow people permission to put theories out there that, although maybe not ultimately sustainable, are good efforts at moving the conversation forward. An ideal day, I do my writing in the morning because when I wake up, that's when I'm freshest and after I have devotional time, I'll just dig in and just start writing in a really focused way. And then normally I'll take a break around noon for lunch and I might come back in the afternoon for editing, a uh, different part of the brain, uh, but I, I realize my brain is not f firing the way it was in the morning. I think something else I do in terms of writing is I have different locations for different types of writing. When I'm writing something, when I'm writing draft for the very first time, uh, what I try to do is actually get outside. And it, I, I've typed outside and whether it's cold as 20 degrees, where I'm out there, I'm bundled up and I'm just kind of typing on my laptop because I just like being outside and being in nature and it's a way of kind of giving me freedom in how I think. And then I've got a whole bunch of prose and then I say, okay, this needs to be edited. So I take it into my office where all my books are there and I can fill in foot footnotes or say, no, this is stupid, I gotta change this. But it's really a different part of your brain, the kind of generative part and the, let, let me fix this part. Uh, I feel that if you get too much angst as you're initially writing and constantly looking over your own shoulder, you get writer's block and you just freeze up and you really can't get it done. So that's, that's the way, reason I have two different modes of writing. I think when I first sit down to write, the important thing is to know where you're going, uh, is to kind of think through your argument in, certain, in terms of, okay, what the, is this paragraph going to look like? Then where am I going for the argument? And then how's it going to end up over here? So just have a sense of the journey uh, as it develops. Sometimes it's interesting, as you're writing, you realize that the journey you thought you would take doesn't really work, so you have to take a detour and reroute. Uh, allow the writing process to be your thinking aloud process. Uh, often, again, in the, in the process of writing, you realize, no, actually there's a better argument I could make than the one I thought I was going to make. And so writing is a process of self-discovery. And, and people say you don't really understand something and you, until you can communicate to others, and I think that's really true. You might have something in your head and say, oh, it's great in my head, but then you start speaking it, or even more accountable, you start writing it, and then you realize, ah, this doesn't quite make sense. Let me try to tighten this up a little bit. Writing helps sharpen your thinking. Yeah, I, I think back to when I was an undergrad and grad student and we had these blue book exams where you say, okay, you got three hours, write down as much as you can on topic X, right? And you're just writing and writing and writing and you're just vomiting information and ideas back at the instructor. Actually, I think that's a good model for initial writing. Uh, just get it all out there as much as you can, and you may be surprised how much of that is actually retrievable. But then you do have to go through the retrieval process and the sorting process and the filtering process. I do think it's a different uh, function of the brain. Uh, to me, it's what's really important for me in the editing process um, is getting the rhythm right, uh, 
and the word choice right. So I think the thesaurus, electronic thesaurus, or you know, if you're old fashioned, the old you know, Roger's thesaurus, it's a really important uh, book because in communicating clearly, you always want just the right word whenever possible. And whenever I mark up my PhD students, I'm always saying, you know, this is what you're saying, but I don't think you're being as clear as you could be. So always strive for clarity in whatever you say. Clarity not just in terms of word choice, but also in terms of concision. Normally, if you can say something in fewer words, you say it much more effectively. There's a lot of fat in academic writing, a lot of things that are said repetitively, unnecessary. If you can cut out the fat, it's gonna bring more of a punch in your writing. The way I work best when it comes to research and writing is if I'm, I begin writing about a topic, I at least know something about the topic initially. And I'll begin with a thesis and say, okay, this is my argument. Here's how I think it's gonna work. And I'll just give it a go, pretending as if it will never have a bibliography or even one footnote. And I'll just write out my thoughts. Well, then after you have a draft of that, and you say, okay, well, now can you support this? Or now let's put this now in conversation with other people who've written about this. Uh, it, so it's like almost like a hermeneutical spiral where of course you've been informed by some of those voices uh, and then you, you're almost responding back in a conversation. Well now it's time for your sources to come back at you and that's when you pull the books off the shelf and get the article and download the articles and you read them and you'll say, oh, I'm missing this piece. Yeah, I really need to get this in here. Or, ooh, I should have made that point. That just won't work at all. Or, no, this guy's wrong. And I'm, but I'm gonna put in the footnotes why I think he's wrong. So to me, again, the initial idea, the initial gestation has to be just kind of getting your stuff out there. Um, I feel that if you try to do too much research up front, you lose track of the question of what you're trying to do. Um, and you get too much angst about being in conversation with the innumerable voices you will be in conversation with. Well, one time I, I wrote an article um, on the diatessaron, and, it, and I dissertated on the diatessaron years ago, but I have really stayed away from that research since I wrote uh, the, my dissertation. And so someone came back and said, hey, will you write this article? And, and I and just did a draft. And I had some footnotes, and there was some support. But I realized I have missed some major uh, publications along the way that were really conversation changers. And so I had to kind of go back and say, okay, let me take that draft back when, when my editor let me know. I said, thank you for saving me for some howlers. Um, I wasn't aware of this really important work. Um, by the way, that's a great reason to, to make sh sure that you have people read your stuff before you send it in, people who are in the know. I think every scholar out there has had the fear that, am I writing this? Am I like missing this major thing that I'm not seeing that's a glaring blind spot in my argument? I think it happens to most people. If it wasn't for a good editor on this particular piece, I would have missed it. So I had to come back and I had to make major revisions uh, to the argument because I was working from a paradigm that was really outmoded. Some books are easy to structure. For example, if you're writing a commentary, you just, you just follow this, the structure of, say, the gospel you're working on and plug, plug in your commentary that way. Uh, if you're making a fresh argument, either in terms of an article or a monograph or a book, um, structure is hugely important. It's actually, I think, one of the most difficult pieces, but important pieces. I think the structure determines everything. If you've got a firm idea of the structure of your argument in mind, everything else is like, is like filling in the gaps. When I work with my doctoral students, it's, most of our conversation has to do with the structure of the argument. What's gonna be argued in what chapter? What's gonna work rhetorically? Uh, what do you assume at the beginning? What's the real question? I mean, it's actually amazing to me how many dissertations sp get spent a couple years in the, in the preparation only to realize, uh, only when the dissertator realizes that actually I'm not arguing for this, I'm arguing for this. And this is over here is the real so what in the real conversation I'm in. And then what's even more astonishing is sometimes you don't have to make all that many changes to the dissertation before it reorients the whole thing to a different question with a different aha. So, um, but th those are all structural pieces. So um, it's very helpful for me 
to uh, just think out loud the structural piece and, and write it down and, and very graphically for me, I'm visual. I, I know for other people, they love to have an interlocutor to talk them through it. When I work with Tom Wright, he said one of your, your main jobs as my research assistant is someone I can talk through the argument with and bounce back. And oftentimes I go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that sounds good. Graduate school is really hard. Uh, it, it's meant to be hard, but it's also very joyful. It's a time in your life when, unlike any other time in your life, where you're actually just set apart for studying, uh, studying what you're passionate about. Even when you become a faculty, you'll get you know, caught up in committee meetings, all kinds of things, and uh, you'll be surprised at how, uh, for most faculty, how little time they actually have devoted to writing. So graduate school is a really special time in your life, uh, so be grateful for that. In terms of maximizing that, here's what I'd say is if it works out for economic reasons, in terms of practicality reasons, if you don't feel like you're in too much of a rush, go deeper rather than rushing through your program, rather than, okay, I just need to get the dissertation done and get out of here. Because you're in a place where you have scholars to talk to about ideas, I really just recommend taking those classic texts, reading them through, grasping them, because there's really no other time in your career when you can conveniently do that. Uh, so I understand uh, time is money, and some people just say, I've got to get out of the program as fast as possible. Um, but if you're in a position where you say, you know what, if I take another year, I can be a much better scholar, and if I land a teaching job, I won't be, have to be embarrassed with my students that they'll ask the wrong questions because I feel unprepared. Uh, I remember that feeling as a first year teacher and just saying, okay, I feel a little bit like a fraud standing up here, you know, talking about all this because there's a lot of things I haven't really thought through carefully. Um, the more you can do in graduate school, if you have the luxury of doing it, do it so that when you're graduated, you feel like I'm ready for this. I love the time when I was Tom Wright's research assistant and from time to time he'll still send me stuff and I'll send thoughts back and just a proud moment of my life and proud to have some participation and contribution to a great scholar's career. Uh, his scholarship has made a huge impact and will for decades to come. I, I learned so many things from Tom Wright. He's, his thinking has been hugely influential for my own thinking, how I read scripture, how I read the story of Israel. Uh, the importance of exile. These are just some of the ideas that were seminal for me and ideas I picked up from Tom Wright. But I also picked up from him, you know, how to write because uh, when I meet with him as his research assistant, he talked out, out loud about the writing process and we'd reflect on scholarship. One thing I loved about Tom was just his willingness to be confident in his ability to just put the ideas down and see what happens with that. And he, he's got a kind of robustness about life where he just says, okay, this is how I'm thinking about it. And sure, there might be these tiny details here or there where he might not have it covered, but he has a big enough sense of the big picture and confident of, enough of that 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 would actually carry the water that um, even if, well, you could fix this footnote here or there, that's not gonna prevent him from saying what needs to be said. I think that's emboldened me to say, okay, uh, I don't have to master every last word of every last article before I write my first own article on this topic or that topic. Sometimes with the really interesting stuff, the real important stuff, is the big picture that comes from gathering the data and just saying, I'm just gonna dive in and make this work. Uh, this field, this discipline, is populated by perfectionists. In, in my estimation, it's often the perfectionists who really struggle to publish.